Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What exactly does the NSA know about you? Ever since 9-11, the National Security Administration has been keeping track of our phone calls, who we've called, and how long our conversations have been. More than likely, they also know some of the emails you have sent and probably many of the websites that you have visited over the past several years. The truth is, I don't think anybody knows exactly how much information the NSA has on them, but you can make no mistake that it is a lot. The illusion of privacy is gone. Now that said, I'm betting that whatever information the NSA has on you, my file is twice as thick. Not because I've done anything nefarious, I certainly haven't, but because I lived out of the country for four years, and apparently that's one of the things they track very closely, is any international communication. On top of that, you all know I've done quite a bit of traveling. At least four trips to Guatemala and one to Israel. And finally, shortly after I moved here to Canyon, I became an approved volunteer, not only for the Colorado Department of Corrections, but also for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Which means that they have my vital statistics safely tucked away somewhere with my picture and my fingerprints on every bureaucratic computer from here to Washington, D.C. Now normally, that would be very disturbing. But I take comfort for two reasons. The first is I've got nothing to hide. The most anyone is going to find on me are these sermons that I post on YouTube. And if some NSA analyst wants to watch my sermons, perhaps that will spread the gospel a bit. <laughs> but the other thing I take comfort in is that I am simply one of millions. There are lots of people who are in the same situation that I am. And so the government can't possibly keep a bird's eye view on me while at the same time watching so many others who also need their attention. Well, for better or worse, we get a very similar picture in our Old Testament reading for today. Today is the very last Sunday of the church year. If you go back and think about it, it started last November, December, as we entered into Advent and prepared for the birth of Jesus. We went into Christmas as we celebrated that the Savior was born in Bethlehem. We journeyed on through Lent and Easter as we remembered our Lord's passion and crucifixion and then celebrated his resurrection. The year went by as we came to Pentecost and rejoiced over the coming of the promised Holy Spirit. And then came the long green season of the year as we turned our attention towards the church and our own growth in Christ. But now on these last few Sundays of the church year, we turn our attention not to what was or what is, but instead what is to come. And in a very strange and yet awesome way, today we celebrate an event that hasn't even happened yet. We celebrate the return of Jesus and that last great and awesome day of the Lord. We celebrate with anticipation, knowing that the Lord will end this veil of tears. But we also celebrate with certainty, knowing that Jesus has promised to come and take us to where he is. And that our Lord always keeps his promises. And so in honor of this very special and very celebratory Sunday, those who organized our lectionary gave us this very odd reading from Malachi. 
I mean, Malachi isn't exactly one of those prophets that you hear a lot about, at least until this time of the church year. And when he does, he says something that's very disturbing. Starting in the very first verse of our text, Malachi writes, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? You know, for all the research I did this last week on the NSA, I think I discovered that they can figure out who you've called and how long you've talked on the phone. But without a warrant, they can't eavesdrop on the content of your conversations. And yet the Lord needs no warrant. The Lord knows exactly who you have talked to. He knows how long you have talked to them. And he knows the content of every conversation. He knows when you have spoken against him. He knows when you have taken his name in vain. He knows when you've lied and cheated. He knows when you've skipped out on worship and Bible study. He notices every single detail of your life. And what's worse is that you can't hide in a crowd. The NSA may not be able to keep a bird's eye view on all of us, but the Lord can. I don't exactly know how he does it, but throughout scripture it is very clear and evident that he keeps a very close eye on every single one of us. And that makes the double whammy. God not only knows who you are, he knows everything you've ever said or done. And that makes the last great and awesome day of the Lord very fearful. As there is no doubt we will be exposed. But here's the thing. If that passage from Malachi had ended at verse 15, there'd be absolutely no hope for any of us. But in verse 16, there is a very dramatic turn in the text. Starting in verse 16, Malachi writes, Then those who fear the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Okay, so once again, Malachi is making it very crystal clear that just because you love the Lord and worship him, you will not escape his attention. I know at times it may seem as though the Lord isn't there. There are times it feels like he isn't watching. Because if he was, life wouldn't be so difficult at times. And yet, even during those dark and difficult times of life, even then, our Heavenly Father has his eye upon you. In our gospel reading for today, it shows that in such a magnificent way. Our gospel reading, we have the story of Jesus as he is being crucified, he's going through the passion. He has been scourged and beaten, mocked and ridiculed, tried, convicted and sentenced. He is carrying his own cross to Calvary. You would think he'd have more than enough to keep his mind occupied, just overcoming the pain and getting through the day. And yet he recognizes everyone around him. It starts out and he notices the women who are weeping for him 
alongside the road. They crucify him and suspend him between heaven and earth. And yet he notices the thief who begs for mercy. In other readings, we know he sees his mother as she cries for him. He notices his disciple John and gives John charge and care for his mother. In other words, it doesn't matter how crazy life may get. God is never too busy to see you, to notice you, and to keep his eye upon you. But what's more is he's also writing it all down. Now that may also seem very frightening. Although I certainly don't have anything to hide from the NSA, I don't want them knowing all my business either. And yet, with the Lord, there's no judgment. The reading goes on. And it says, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And that right there is the very, very big deal of this text. You see, it's not as though you and I are any better or worse than the people around us. We have neighbors and friends who do a lot for our community and for those in need. Some of them do even more than we are able to. But what gets recorded in the Lord's book of remembrance, it has absolutely nothing to do with how good or bad you are throughout your life. Instead, what gets recorded is based solely upon who we place our fear and trust in. Which means that for those of us who fear the Lord, He has forgiven all of our wrongs. All of your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And for his sake, God no longer sees our mistakes. You can think of it as selective surveillance. God knows and he sees absolutely everything. But the only things that are recorded, the only things that will be revered, revealed on that last and great awesome day of the Lord are the good things that we have done in Jesus' name. Which means, if you remember being a Boy Scout and you helped that little old lady across the street, that will be remembered. Perhaps you volunteered for VBS one year and it was one of the most difficult weeks you've ever had. You were overwhelmed by the rambunctious and rowdiness of the kids. And yet, somehow, you still managed to tell them how much Jesus loves them. That will be remembered. Or that time you sat with your widowed aunt and just talked to her for hours. Reassuring her that she's not alone or forgotten. That too will be remembered. All the times you baked cookies and cupcakes and pies for church funerals and memorials. All those years you tirelessly sang for the choir and served on the church council. All those prayers you said for people you'd never even met that came over the prayer chain. Those are the things that will be remembered while everything else is very quietly forgiven and forgotten. The NSA has nothing on our Lord, but the Lord only remembers and he only records the good that you've done in Jesus' name. You know, even after Edward Snowden revealed all the secret surveillance that the government does on us 
Somehow Congress has found the will to renew the Patriot Act and those aspects that grant them authority to keep an eye on us. Apparently you and I, we are our own worst enemy as we have to be protected from ourselves. It's a sad statement, but apparently it's true. Because the truth is we all have hidden secrets. We all have sins that we just assume nobody else know about. And although you may be able to keep them out of the prying eyes of the government, you can't keep them from the Lord. The Lord knows exactly who you are. And he knows everything you've ever said or done. There is no hiding from God. But there is also no fear in Jesus Christ. On that last great and awesome day, the day that we celebrate on this last Sunday of the church year, there is no fear because all of your sins in Jesus Christ are forgiven. And the only thing that will be revealed is the good that you've done in his name. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our coming King. Amen.